Welcome and good afternoon. Um, my name is Anselm Frank and I'm one of the four curators of the exhibition, Parapolitics. Um, I'm doing this short introduction on my own uh, since my colleague Tonya Mayaka is going to be on stage several times this afternoon and evening. Um, a quotation. God grant that not only the love of liberty, but a thorough knowledge of the rights of man may pervade all the nations of the earth, so that a philosopher may set his foot anywhere on its surface and say, this is my country. This inscription by Benjamin Franklin, you find here at the entrance of the former Kongresshalle. And it is perhaps quite telling that the grand universalist ideal expressed by these words, the right to set foot everywhere, is to be granted to the philosopher in particular, or perhaps to the philosopher only. The Kongresshalle, itself a monument to the Cold War confrontation and donation um, by the American government, by Congress, <clears throat> as you all know, was transformed into the Haus der Kulturen der Welt in 1989. In fact, before the wall came down. And this transformation reflected a general shift away from the ideological polarization of the Cold War, <clears throat> when the West has seemingly become, come out victorious, to questions <clears throat> of globalization, pluralism and identity. But perhaps today it is important to reflect critically on the destiny of this particular politics of culture to its pitfalls and the problems that it does not make go away. It is our understanding here <clears throat> that our task is to critically reflect on the increasingly unhappy state of globalization in a spirit that defends the values of the Enlightenment and of democracy, but that points to what has remained unrealized of these values and ideas in order to revive them on more inclusive grounds. In Amos Tutuola's second novel, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, from 1954, three years before this building was established, the young protagonist is running away from slave catchers when he accidentally crosses the border of reality as he knows it. His flight from bondage, however, does not earn him freedom. Rather, he finds himself in an absurd liminal world of speaking symbols and delirious phantasms in which the entire regime of meaning production constantly shifts. Freedom in the bush of ghosts, <coughs> borrowing and changing the title of Tutuola's novel, is the conference accompanying parapolitics, cultural freedom and the Cold War an exhibition tracing how the many meanings of modernism were deployed in the struggle for cultural hegemony during the Cold War. The exhibition treats the history of one of, this, one of the CIA's secretly funded front organizations, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, to consider the ideological contradictions and moral ambiguities of advocating freedom and transparency by channels that are themselves removed from democratic accountability. To be clear, the problem we have been trying to address in this project is not the funding of art in the name of freedom and democracy. Culture needs support and is obviously never free of influence and the use of power. But covered funding does constitute a problem. It undermines as in the case of the CCF, the Congress for Cultural Freedom, the very autonomy that the latter institution sought to promote. It undermines the core of what they defined as essential 
to freedom, the possibility to say no. It undermines what many writers and artists were thinking of the political position and efficacy of their work. And there's no doubt that a great deal of artists who have received support in one way or another by the Central Intelligence Agency, though by no means all, would have rejected any association with a body whose defense of the free world involved the subversion of democratic processes and the support of autocratic regimes and dictatorships. We made reference to Amos Tutuola's novel <coughs> to open up a space of reflection that reaches beyond the ideological confrontation of the Cold War in its reductive version. We sought to make space in the narrative of history for other perceptions beyond the confines of what was thinkable and sayable in Berlin, Paris, or New York. This is what this conference is trying to do as well, not to recount a history about which a great deal is still unknown, but to engage in a reflection on the uses of art and the politics of culture in a moment of danger, where the defense of democratic rights and freedoms is increasingly used to normalize hatred and defend privileges that have violent roots deep down in modern history. And with this, I'd like to call upon my colleague Paz Guevara to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to introduce to all of you Patrick Iver, professor of history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in US, and author of the recently published book, Neither Peace Nor Freedom, which has been fundamental to us to identify the political complexity and shifting position among intellectuals of the post-war period. If the, uh, if the artwork of Bolus Pajarpa, maybe you saw in the show, it is a sculptor of a book of history of Brazil intervened by CIA disclosed documents. If this work shows the lack of historians in critically revisioning their local historiographies, Patrick Evers is for us an exceptional and a critical contribution. Patrick Evers lecture uh, today the many meanings of freedom in the Cold War, will explore this complexity and the many meanings of freedom in the period. Please help me to welcome Patrick Iver. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers of, the, uh, of this conference and exhibition for the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. Uh, let me begin. It was once a kind of Cold War joke. Any organization with the words free or freedom in its name was in fact an instrument of US state power. The National Committee for a Free Europe, CIA sponsored. Radio Free Europe, CIA backed. And of course the Congress for Cultural Freedom, CIA dependent. Maybe it's not a very good joke because the joke is basically true. It's perhaps a kind of mirror version of the kind of communist humor that is so commonly used as a way to understand how ordinary people responded psychologically to the hypocrisies of the systems under which they lived. It was an observation that showed the connection between the propaganda of the idea of freedom and the reality of American power. In NSC 68, published in 1950, it's one of the founding documents of the Cold War in the United States. Its author, Paul Nitze, called freedom, quote, the most contagious idea in history, more contagious than the idea of submission to authority. But did he really believe it? If you assume that what we truly believe is better revealed by our actions than by our words, then Nitze and the US government that adopted his understanding of a fight between a free society and a totalitarian one, they seem less confident in the power of the idea of freedom for they tried to spread it with a significant rush of covert propaganda and frequently did not trust people to fight for it on their own, at least not in the right way. Freedom has seized the offensive, yelled Arthur Kirstler at the closing of the Foundational Congress for Cultural Freedom at the Free University here in Berlin in 1950. You can see clips of it in the exhibition. Uh, you're right, at the Titania Palace, excuse me. Uh, what then are we to make of this idea of Cold War freedom? Was it something more than propaganda? 
Was it simply the moral language that American capitalism used to justify ex its expansion? To begin to answer these questions, we must first observe that it was intended to be an idea that was both universal and particular. It was supposed to be a global idea, but there was much local variation. It was capacious enough as a concept to have many ancestors so that one imagines it like a ball of twine with many strands rolled together, with many colors remaining unblended. Nitz's NSC 68, for example, was full of contrasts between a free society and a slave society, which speaks to particularly American anxieties about its own past. It defines America as an open, welcoming, welcoming society of free men, of individual rights, and it may be partially that, but it is also, of course, a former slave society, which did not then and still does not fully grant all of its citizens equal treatment and opportunity. NSC 68 thus projected some of the US's own anxieties about the ways that its own idea of freedom was compromised onto the Soviet Union. In other words, to give it a particular power in the context of a Truman administration that was, to its credit, taking some steps to end forms of racial discrimination. But this message would not have the same resonance, nor did it need to across all borders. What did matter to the Cold War, of course, was the way that freedom defined itself as the antithesis of totalitarianism, of communism, and of Stalinism. This could be made globally intelligible because communism was a global movement, and because for the purposes of the propaganda war, many of those who took up anti-communist themes were, as is well known, ex-communists or former fellow travelers. So what I would like to do with the talk is to highlight the ways that the idea of freedom was deployed and did shift and stretched as it moved across borders. It was found wanting and found meaningful in different places and in different times. And I hope that by observing the ways that it experienced these changes, we can contribute to consideration of how we might move beyond the Cold War's idea of freedom and towards one that might be more appropriate to the post-Cold War world in which we live. To find this, I think we'll have to listen to some of the critics of the Cold War version of freedom without abandoning the concept or indeed accepting their alternatives. Let us consider then how the term was used and deployed in the cultural Cold War in Latin America in the early years of the 1950s. To understand what ideas of freedom were powerful and meaningful to individuals, it is of course necessary to consider the ways that their personal lives intersected with global politics. And one of the key actors in the cultural Cold War in Latin America was actually a Spaniard named Julian Gorkin. His name was Julian Gomez. Uh, he was born with that name in 1901. He chose his uh, political nom de guerre, Gorkin, by putting together the names of the Soviet writer Gorky and the N from Lenin. But more Gorky than Lenin, I guess. But Gorky broke with the common turn in 1929. Apparently, he tells us at least, because of disillusionment with the Stalinization of the state apparatus. Uh, during the Spanish Civil War, he was an important militant of the anti-Stalinist Marxist party, known as the Partido Obrero de Unificación Marxista, the, the PUM. Uh, which was the subject of persecution by pro-Soviet authorities. After escaping Spain, he made his way to a Mexican exile. Mexico at that time had the world's most generous exile policy for left-wing refugees. It's why Trotsky was there when no one else uh, would have him. Uh, but by the time that he arrived, Trotsky had been uh, assassinated by, uh, by a Stalinist assassin, and it was... Gorkin, who helped to identify that assassin of Trotsky, working with the secret police for someone he had known in Spain, and he helped also to secure passage for his like-minded friend, the novelist Victor Serge, with whom he had lived, who lived for a number of years. For a time, they felt and feared that they would be assassinated as Trotsky had been. None of us has a heart condition or the slightest intention to commit suicide, they wrote in a letter addressed to the president of Mexico in January 1942, pleading for some form of protection. And indeed, there, they do, uh, were assassination attempts and uh, at a, a meeting, I suppose, not unlike this one, the room was rushed and they were uh, beaten by, uh, by thugs that were organized by pro-communist unions. By the end of the 1940s, uh, Serge was dead of a heart attack. Uh, 
and Gorkin was back in Paris. He was shepherding a Spanish communist general turned anti-communist, Valentin El Campesino Gonzalez, through Europe and Latin America. El Campesino, which means the peasant, was barely literate, and Gorkin was effectively working as his handler and ghostwriter. El Campesino was now testifying that the Soviet Union represented nothing more than fascism with a red flag. Gorkin was writing his articles. Read your article for today in case somebody questions you about it, he told El Campesino during their trip to Cuba. And eventually they came to Mexico, where they were set up at a CIA safe house in the town of Cuernavaca, kept hidden even from the FBI, who was looking for them. And there Gorkin formed El Campesino's life story into a, uh, a, an autobiography that was quickly published and widely distributed in multiple languages. One of the things that this shows is that by the time that the Cultural Cold War had been taken up in earnest by the US government, someone like Gorkin had been hard at work for almost two decades. It's rooted deeply in the politics of the 1930s. He had been part of anti-communist networks within the labor movement for at least a decade. They helped him get to Mexico. What the Cold War did bring was money like a flooding rain over a desert of left politics, where once there was little, now there was too much. Gorkin had had a lonely agenda for a time. Now he would end up working with the CIA for many years. He became the Latin American representative of the Congress for Cultural Freedom after its formation and the editor of its Spanish language magazine, Cuadernos del Congreso por la Libertad de la Cultura, known as Cuadernos. It means workbooks, but you can see it in the exhibition upstairs. In the early years of the Congress, its chief intellectual opponent was the peace movement, closely aligned with communist politics and the Communist Information Bureau. Beginning in the late 1940s, the peace movement championed the idea that the Western countries, especially the United States, were imperialist warmongers, while the Soviet Union was the paladin of social justice and anti-imperialism. At the same time, of course, within the Soviet Union, Stalin sought to enact a very repressive agenda domestically. The post-war period resurrected socialist realism as the only possible officially sanctioned art form. Everything else was formalism, decadent, uh, bourgeois. Uh, peace propaganda focused on Western warmongering, uh, rebuilding, in contrast with the supposedly uh, pacifist Soviet Union. Not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, peace drives within the countries now part of the Soviet Union were used to finance rearming, but that is the world uh, for you. The other important theme of this time was anti-cosmopolitanism. It was anti-Semitic in the Soviet context, but adaptable globally as a critique of imperialism and capitalist culture. Uh, so you can find in the communist press of the time the argument that cosmopolitanism, essentially meaning Western capitalist culture, had become the, quote, predatory weapon of U.S. imperialism, which inverts the traditional critique of capitalism by saying that the U.S. dazzled its citizens out of their individuality and thus their ability to produce works of art. The Latin American peace movement was limited largely to its communist parties and the communist and fellow traveling activist artists. Pablo Neruda is probably the best known and most important of all of them. He had been an organizer for cultural activities during the Spanish Civil War. He had joined Chile's Communist Party, was elected a senator as uh, of the Communist Party in Chile. In 1947, Chile passed a law outlawing communism and he fled across the Andes and then to Europe where he appeared before a stunned public at a peace event in Paris in 1949. He spent the next years of his life working on behalf of the Soviet-aligned peace movement and tried uh, in this period of time, not throughout his entire career, to write socialist realist poetry. Not because he had to, but because he thought it would be a good idea. At a major peace gathering held in Mexico City in 1949, he read and performed part of his uh, masterpiece, the Canto General. This, is, uh, this section was called Que despierte el leñador, let the woodcutter awaken, and the woodcutter refers to Abraham Lincoln, who's famous for, well, in, according to legend, for splitting logs before he became president. Uh, 
Neruda's poem took the form of a song and a plea to the United States for a return of the spirit of Abraham Lincoln, who could put an end to the blight of racism and warmongering and hatred that Neruda saw as typifying the United States of the late 1940s. Let Abraham come and let him heft his people's ax against the new slavers, against the slave's whip, against the poison press, against the bloody merchandise that they want to sell. And he imagined a smiling multiracial uprising against the manufacturer of hatred. It was epic poetry and a pure distillation of the politics of the peace movement adapted to the Latin American setting. If North America's hero lay dormant and absent, Que Despierte Leñador offered a parallel figure who was, for Neruda, the very picture of present vigilance, Joseph Stalin. The lines to Stalin are things like, his bedroom light is turned off late. The world and his country allow him no rest. At a conference he organized in 1953 in Santiago, Neruda said, quote, I know and admire the Soviet people and its leaders for their extraordinary deeds, indelible in human history. But what I admire in that land is its most, what I most admire in that land is its dedication to culture. Perhaps above all else, with the full flowering of the individual as never before achieved in history. What is conceptually interesting about this kind of statement, other than its obvious naivete, is that it doesn't seem to reject liberal individualism. It just claims that it's the Soviet Union that better ensures it. Jorge Amado, the Brazilian novelist, was another peace activist and made a similar argument. Amado spent much of the early 1950s living in a castle in Czechoslovakia, and like Picasso, uh, he named his, his daughter Paloma, Dove, uh, after the dove that Picasso painted for the, that Parisian exhibition in, in 1949. Uh, in any case, uh, Amadou makes a similar, uh, a similar kind of argument to Neruda. How can you as a writer admire and love the Soviet Union, a Brazilian official once asked him. And he replied that he loved the Soviet Union because of the full freedom of printing, criticism, and self-criticism that existed there, explaining that there was no need for an opposition press when publishing responsibilities lay with the state because the state was the authentic representation of the people. It isn't that freedom is the wrong goal, says Amadou. It's that it's in the Soviet Union that it is fully guaranteed. Now, of course, there is something, in my view, uh, pathetic and offensive about this, especially, of course, in the years of Stalin. Amadou writes in his memoirs of his deep sadness at learning of the existence of official Soviet anti-Semitism and thus the falsity of his beliefs about the achievement of Soviet ethnic and racial harmony but this hadn't stopped him from using that language of cosmopolitanism in peace propaganda. Under Stalin, Amadou later reflected, it was not easy being a communist, but to stop remained, at least for him, and at least for a time, unthinkable. A few years later, he would change his mind. Part of the reason that it was hard was that people like Neruda and Amadou had become more than simple ideologists. They were also symbols of the damage done to Latin American democracy, to freedom, let us acknowledge, by anti-communism. I've mentioned a few peace conferences that did, did take place. Here's one of, in 1949, and you can see the, uh, the peace-inspired artwork behind the speaker. Uh, and then the one that Neruda sponsored in Santiago in 1953. But there were many more that were planned, that were broken up by police violence or prohibited from taking place at all. Hopes for a more democratic Latin America, which had bubbled up at the end of World War II, broke on the rocks of Cold War politics. Nobel laureate, the Chilean poet Gabriela Mistral, wrote an essay speaking out against the repression of the peace movement saying that Latin America was paying a cost in intimidation and self-censorship. Yet she complained when a couple of years later, communists took to printing and distributing thousands of copies of her essay as if it had been written specifically in support of the Soviet-aligned peace movement, rather than an argument against its suppression. There were two kinds of repression in this, in two problems of repression in the peace movement. One was the repression of criticism of the Soviet Union that its partisans engaged in. But the other was the suppression of the pro-peace the pro movement, which almost certainly did more damage to democratic politics 
in Latin America than its presence would have done. But this reality was in turn very difficult for the professional anti-communists to grasp, even when they cared to. In 1954, when the Congress for Cultural Freedom held its first international meeting in Latin America, it too was in Santiago, Chile, a direct response to the one organized by Neruda in 1953. Uruguayan poet Roberto Ibanez offered a toast to the only form of imperialism that I recognize, liberty, he said. Now, he was surely aware of the inversion of assumptions. Did imperialism not negate freedom? That was the source of, I suppose, what wit there was supposed to be in his remark. But that the Congress for Cultural Freedom, to which he belonged, was covertly financed by the US government as, the weapon of, as a weapon of the Cold War, heightened the contradictions at the heart of his toast. The imperialism of liberty would prove a pithy description of the politics of the organization to which he belonged. Let me find a picture for you. These were the, the offices. Some of the magazines that you can see on the shelf are again some of the same magazines that you can see as part of the exhibition. During this international forum of 1954, Chile's communist newspaper tried to establish the un-Chilean nature of the Congress for Cultural Freedom by accusing it of taking money from a foreign power. Even the Congress's delegates wondered who had paid their travel expenses. The public story was that the Congress received no US government money, but was funded by free trade union organizations and private foundations, including the so-called Feshman Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, in truth, the, the Congress for Cultural Freedom did receive some clean money from the Rockefeller and Ford Foundations, but the delegates would not have known that both the Free Trade Union organizations and the Feshman, which probably refers to the Farfield Foundation, headed by Julius Fleischmann, were conduits for CIA money. Without this knowledge, the Chilean Committee of the Congress tried to make its source of funding an asset in a question and answer section of its new national magazine, Cultura y Libertad, culture and, culture and Freedom, it argued that receiving money from private US foundations did not make it an instrument of US imperialism. The very existence of private foundations it held proved the difference between the directed cultural world of the totalitarian states and one in which private organizations were allowed to operate without government control. Now, that is a real difference. But obviously the difference was not quite as large as they imagined. The obvious irony being that those private foundations in the United States, which were supposed to demonstrate the difference between totalitarian and free ones, were acting as concealed instruments of the US government. The Congress for Cultural Freedom worked hard throughout uh, its existence to uh, attack the pro-peace artists, to undermine Neruda's international reputation, including launching campaigns to keep him from being awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature which were, uh, of course, eventually unsuccessful. But during the 1950s, the Congress's other major artistic project was directed against the hegemony of the Marxist painters in Mexico. Now, the, Mexico had a social revolution approximately between 1910 and 1920. By the early 1950s, uh, it was charting a more conservative course that nevertheless tried to institutionalize the idea of revolutionary nationalism of the revolutionary period uh, as the foundation for its authority. So you had the, the, a contradictory situation in which state support for the fine arts from a conservative government uh, worked to create a kind of official muralism, the kind of works that we are most familiar with uh, as representatives of the, of the Mexican style in the arts. The irony is that uh, the conservative president of Mexico, who is repressing the left, turns to Marxist painters to craft the official story of the nation, showing heroic revolutionary masses overcoming the revolution's familiar cast of villains. Now, these ironies were not lost on painters coming of age in the 1950s. They saw a landscape clogged with official reverence to the big three, the big three being Diego Rivera, uh, David Alfredo Siqueiros and Jose Clemente Orozco, who had passed away recently. 
but little support for experimentation and a chill on practices that could be construed as critical of the ruling government, such as the depictions of contemporary poverty. These younger painters would say that for as much as somebody like Rivera or Siqueiros wanted to portray class struggle as an engine of history, it was always something that occurred in the past and was no longer uh, present. The ongoing debate about politically committed art and the Mexican school stretched back years before the creation of the Congress, at least to the 1944 publication of Siqueiros' Orthodox Manifesto, No hay más ruta que la nuestra, there's no other path but ours. By the early 1950s, it was evident that a new generation of painters, known as that of the breakaway generation, was defying Siqueiros' pronouncement by modifying both the form and content of their painting. Any number of the muralists' assumptions were challenged by the painters of the breakaway, the depictions of mass actors in history, the interweaving of leftist politics and Mexican nationalism, the disfavor shown to easel painting, and the rejection of abstraction for realism. Indeed, the very identification of painting as a form of political action. Some of the artists who embraced different forms of less realist painting identified their works with a specifically anti-communist project, rejecting the, what they saw as the compulsory moralizing of the great living muralists. Uh, Rufino Tamayo, for example, who inspired many of the painters of the breakaway. Here's some Tamayo work from the 1950s. Had been exhibited along, Rivera, along with Rivera and Siqueiros in the 1920s and 1930s but his color-soaked canvases, sometimes featuring oblique references to pre-Columbian art, bore little relationship to the work of Rivera or Siqueiros. Rivera, questioned about Tamayo in, 1940, in 1954, excuse me, said that his work had some merit, but that, quote, some great artists avoid revolutionary and anti-imperialist content in their works, preferring not to be combative, engaged artists. That, said Rivera, is selling silence, and it would be better just to take money to defend imperialism openly so that everyone could see what the relationship was. The Congress made Rivera its principal antagonist. Rivera had been a peace militant. Let's look at a few of, uh, a few of his works. So this one, uh, which is apparently made its way to Mao's China and was lost, is Nightmare of War, Dream of Peace from 1952. And you can see in the upper left corner, there are Stalin and Mao handing a, a, a pen uh, and a dove to Uncle Sam, uh, Marianne, and John Bull, representing the UK, US, and France, obviously. Uh, and they're reluctant. What you probably can't see in the detail here in the, in the picture is that Uncle Sam is carrying a machine gun behind his back <laughs> and a Bible. <laughs> you can also see Frida Kahlo there in the lower right uh, in a wheelchair, right, gathering signatures for peace campaigns. Um, uh, Rivera was, and Kahlo were married, not for the first time, but they were married at this time, and she was towards the end of her life when she also, uh, as, as he did, sort of re-embraced uh, Stalinism. It's a strange trajectory for Rivera because he, he went through a, a, a Trotskyist period and then went back to Stalinism, which is not the, not the typical Cold War trajectory. Um, here, at, uh, the, the, uh, there's a large, almost mausoleum-like structure that's built to house Rivera's collection of pre-Columbian art called Anahuacali, and you can see in the murals, in the stone murals that are made there, his, uh, the unification of themes of peace and communism and the indigenous art that interested him. And here, uh, Rivera, who uh, came down with cancer, went to the Soviet Union for treatment. He believed that the Soviet Union's uh, atomic technology was peaceful and that its cobalt bomb technology would cure his cancer. He died a couple of years later. Uh, but here is from 1956, during that time, uh, May Day procession in, in Moscow. So he was sort of the principal, as I said, the principal artistic antagonist of 
uh, of the Congress for Cultural Freedom in Mexico. In 1954, Rivera pointed specifically to the Congress for Cultural Freedom's defense of the idea of freedom of expression to argue that the idea was in fact a weapon of the US Department of State and other conservative and foreign influences. The debate between old and new styles thus manifested in part as a conversation about the meaning of freedom of expression for the contemporary artist. Now Rivera, of course, was not wrong to argue that a deliberate attempt had been made to identify certain types of art with freedom. The history of abstract expressionism's exhibition as a kind of artistic production uh, that neither Nazis nor Stalinists could allow is by now well known. And many of the, uh, although many of the artists who practiced abstract expressionism rejected that label and fully intended their art to be a radical critique of post-war society and the commodification of the arts, this did not, present, uh, did not prevent the enlistment of their works in a tug of war widely understood to be between liberalism and totalitarianism. Rivera had also been correct in arguing that the Congress for Cultural Freedom was at the center of debates about freedom of expression in the arts in Mexico. In a way, that was proof enough that the embrace of apparently apolitical painting was in no way free of political content. The Mexican Association for Cultural Freedom, which is the local branch of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, formed a joint arrangement with the gallery space of a fairly conservative newspaper, Excelsior, conservative in those years anyway, to hold meetings, conferences, and art exhibitions. The Excelsior galleries exhibited the work of artists who did not conform to that tradition of socially committed art on a grand scale that had become identified as belonging to the Mexican school. The poet and, and art critic Octavio Paz, who had once been tutored by Victor Serge and Julian Gorkin in anti-communist politics, but by then eclipsed them both in fame, appeared at the Excelsior galleries in his capacity as the great defender of abstract art in Mexico. The Congress took pride in what it saw as breaking the di dictatorship of the communist artists on the Mexican art scene. At a group exhibition of young painters in 1958, some of whom painted in abstract forms, not all of them, the Mexican Associated Association celebrated them for fulfilling, quote, the first and highest responsibility of the artist, the defense of culture, and therefore of freedom. Now, if the Congress for Cultural Freedom's contributions to the arts in Latin America were fairly modest during the 1950s, its very presence inflamed debate. It helped to turn the idea of freedom into a weapon, as critics on the left cited it as powerful evidence that liberal notions of freedom were a form of imperialist propaganda. Freedom was the mantra of the Congress during the 1950s, and it was pronounced to be synonymous with anti-communism. But insofar as its members were right that freedom as they understood it required anti-communism, they did not all see clearly that anti-communism was perhaps a necessary but not a sufficient condition for it. The clearest evidence of this is Julian Gorkin and his shamefully complicit actions around the CIA-supported coup against the democratically elected Guatemalan president of Jacobo Arbenz in 1954. Arbenz uh, had redistributed some land belonging to the United Fruit Company to individual peasants. Uh, and um, the CIA worked to see that he was overthrown in 1954. The, the colonel that the CIA backed to replace him was named Carlos Castillo Armas, and Castillo Armas undid uh, the land reform and other uh, democratic reforms that Arbenz had undertaken. At Congress events, Gorkin repeatedly tried to defend Arbenz's successor, Castillo Armas, as some kind of liberal. Gorkin's politics, who were rooted in his experiences in the Spanish Civil War and in the, the, uh, the cultural wars of earlier decades in Europe, led him to see Arbenz as a communist danger. At Congress gatherings, he tried to get other participants to sign petitions of support for Carlos Castillo Armas, who sent telegrams of adherence to Congress for Cultural Freedom events, things like that. When Gorkin tried to call for the support of Castillo Armas at a Congress event in 1956, this one in fact, the rest of those attending, almost all of them from Latin America, rebuked Gorkin. The next day, reading about this in the newspaper, 
a Guatemalan writer and politician named Mario Monteforte Toledo, who had disliked Arbenz, showed up to the conference to add further context. Though he had opposed Arbenz, he liked the coup against him even less. And after Castillo Armas came to power, Monteforte returned to Guatemala, where he published two opposition newspapers critical of the new government and its ties to the United States. Eventually, in 1956, citing a conspiracy on Castillo Armas' life, using this as an excuse, the Guatemalan government sent soldiers to literally throw sand into his presses, pulled him from his house, took him to prison, and then dumped him at the Honduran border, along with other intellectual dissidents. Now in Mexico City, Monteforte Toledo told the audience, North American imperialism is real, he said, and implored those in the audience with academic jobs in the United States to explain this to the North American public. We're still trying. Gorkin's endorsement of Castillo Armas in Guatemala, for example, showed that he identified freedom with the forceful suppression of a popular political movement. When the Congress was accused of being right-wing or of acting in the interests of U.S. empire, Gorkin's behavior would be the sort of thing that would justify these charges. They bring to my mind the short poem by the Chilean anti-poet Nicanor Parra, quote, and that was how they converted him from a useful idiot of the left to a useless idiot of the right. Gorkin's really was the logic of the imperialism of liberty, and it hollowed out the meaning of the term, both for those who thought that liberty was an important value and for those that saw in it only the interests of empire. Mario Monteforte Toledo, his presses destroyed by Castillo Armas, was fully aware that freedom required more than just anti-communism. And in this, I think, we can reach the end of the conversation about the Cold War, about Cold War freedom's shifting meanings. It makes little sense to me to deny that people experienced oppressive restrictions of life and freedom under communism. Of course they did. Artistic hymns to Stalin's greatness have not aged well, to say the least. They were not attractive, I think, even at the time. But as Gorkin's conversation with Monteforte Toledo shows, anti-communist versions of freedom could also be quite far from liberating. They could be the essence of the imperialism of liberty. One peace movement activist, the Argentine writer Maria Rosa Oliver, wrote to Nelson Rockefeller, her former boss in 1952, quote, persecution of the peace movement responds to the determination of a minority to maintain a status quo that favors only itself. She described the poor residents of Rio de Janeiro without basic services or hygiene, living cheek by jowl with its luxurious beaches, and wondered how long such a situation could last. Will residents of the favelas go to die for democracy or freedom, she asked. The Cold War that in the name of those two words is making already precarious conditions of life get worse day by day makes of democracy a tyranny and leaves freedom only as promises on paper. Freedom may be a vaguely defined concept. It can certainly be turned into propaganda, but there is also something real about it, something that people have found to be worth fighting for. It seems to me that we are still living in the shadow of the idea of freedom as Cold War propaganda. Now, what is good about a propaganda campaign is that it can give people a set of common expectations. What is bad about it is that it can condition them to be cynical about moral claims. Cold War freedom did mean something, but it also served as the ideological cloak, masking power and self-interest. With the Cold War now in the past, it seems to me that we have the opportunity to move beyond this Cold War understanding of freedom and to incorporate something that its critics actually understood well, namely that some measure of social equality matters to the way that people experience power over their own lives. If you look back at the propaganda of, I mean, the work of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, it was, in the European context, explicitly social democratic. But in much of the rest of the world, while it might be that in name and in the way that it presented itself, the politics of the organization to which it belonged did not make that kind of uh, social democratic society possible. 
If I'm right about this, that the idea of freedom inherited from the Cold War needs neither to be rejected nor embraced, but instead given a fuller, richer meaning, it remains decidedly unclear what people will make of this opportunity. At the moment, the political signs are, in my view, not especially encouraging. What the end of the Cold War has offered is only an opportunity to make a more meaningful idea of freedom. It is no guarantee that we will give this task the care and attention it will require.